Hey friends, it's good to be back with you. Today I'd like to talk to you about integral transforms. Now this sounds pretty abstract, and on some level I guess it is, but it's dang handy, and there's a fair chance that you're using these already, maybe without knowing it. So if you look it up on Wikipedia or in a math book, what the book or the article will tell you is that integral transforms transform a function from one space to another. We. What does that mean? Well, let me write down an expression here for the, the generalized form of a transform, and then we'll, we'll make it real here. But let's take a look at the details first. So if I have a function of some variable, and I'll call it that variable t, I can do this to it. OK. This is, an, this is the integral transform. This is the initial function you've got. Okay, that's the transformed function. And this thing here, k, this is called a kernel function. Okay, not the current, like, not like an army kernel, different kind of kernel. It's called a kernel function. All right, all integral transforms look like this. And the difference is the kernel function. If you could use a different kernel function, you get a different transform. But they're all transforms, and they all work kind of like this. So what they do is they transform a function from one space to another. Well. Now, to a mathematician, t is just a variable. It's just a letter. To us as maybe physicists, engineers, whatever your, your specialty is, t sure sounds like time. Well, I don't know about you. I live in time domain. I bet you live in time domain, too. So if I record data, I only know how to record it in time domain. I don't know how to, how to record it any other way. There's no other world that I live in. So I'm stuck here. I don't always want to look at data in time domain. I might want to look at it some other way. Well, what would that some other way be? I got an idea. I have been learning how to play the mandolin. I got one for my birthday a little while ago, and it's going, you know, well enough. I'm not I'm nobody's musician, but it's fun. And uh, it turns out I have to use integral transforms in order to play the mandolin. Now, a friend of mine told me mandolin is just Italian for out of tune. So before I play this thing, I've got to tune it. What's that got to do with integral transforms? Well, first thing we're going to need is a mandolin. Got one right here. I put my pick down right there. So this is my mandolin. This is the one I keep at work anyway. Got a better one at home. Um, and let's say it's out of tune. You know, to play it, got a little pick here. What if that's out of tune? How do I tune it? Well, I use this thing. This little dingus here is a chromatic tuner. I clip it on the headstock, turn it on. Turn it on, Dr. French, there we go. Turn it on, and it tells me not time domain data, because I don't care what the time domain data is. I want to know what the fundamental frequency of that string is, and it should be G, was it 192 hertz or something like that? That one's okay. That one's a little flat. That's a D. Okay, there. Now it's in tune better. Now what this thing showed me is not time domain data. It showed me, turn it off here, frequency domain data. I don't care what this string does in time domain. I need to know what frequency is there. And so what that little box tells me, I clip it on here. There's a little accelerometer that senses the vibration of the headstock, and it tells me what frequency it's making. Oh, now I care. That sounds great. B, C, D. OK, that sounds like it's in tune. So now I can play these little pieces I'm learning to play, knowing that I'm in tune. I just had to take 
time domain data and transform it into frequency domain data. Well, what kind of transform is that? Now, this thing isn't actually doing a transform. It's doing some other stuff. But the idea remains. So if I want to transform time domain into frequency domain, i got to use some kind of kernel here, right? Well, the kernel I'm using right there is e to the minus i omega t. That's the kernel for a Fourier transform. All right? That's for a Fourier transform. Now, there are other transforms. There's a Laplace transform. If you look on Wikipedia, there's a whole list of transforms. Now, by far, by far, the ones you're going to see the most are the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform. And the only difference between them is the kernel functions are different. For the Laplace transform, it's e to the minus st. So I'll write that down here. What's s? s equals sigma plus i omega. It's closely related to a Fourier transform. Now, I said we use these all the time. What do you use them for? Well, Fourier transforms, in my experience, we've been, I've used them for transforming time domain data that's from acoustics or structural vibration measurements, transforming them into frequency domains so we can look at them and analyze them. Laplace transforms, you can use them for that too, but most of the time I've seen Laplace transforms used to do signal processing and in particular to solve differential equations. So the big idea here is when you transform from one space to another, you're transforming from a space where you just you can't solve the problem. You don't know what to do in this space. If you could transform it into a different space, it makes it tractable again. So when I'm trying to listen to my mandolin, I can listen to it, or I could maybe I plotted the time domain signal coming out of a string. What's that? I don't know what to do with it. I take that same. Uh, time domain plot uh, data, that measured data, transform it into frequency domain, there's going to be a big spike in there where the fundamental frequency is. Okay, that's something I can work with. With Laplace, when you're trying to solve a differential equation, you've got a differential equation, say, in time. I don't know how to solve it. It's too hard to solve. If I transform it into Laplace domain, it's easy to solve. So you solve it in that domain, and then you transform it back into time where you need it. So the other thing it does is transforms Unsolvable problems are very difficult to solve problems into much simpler ones. You solve them there, transform back to get what you need. So those are the, that's the utility of integral transforms. They're really, really handy. And if you do any kind of acoustic testing or analysis, structural or dynamic testing or analysis, or any kind of signal processing, you're going to use most likely one of those two. One more thing you need to know that when I transform from one to the other, I've changed how the function looks, but I haven't changed its meaning. And in the case of test data, I haven't, if I do it correctly, I have not destroyed any information. That's how you can go back and forth between these two. You have to follow the rules, but if you do, you don't destroy any information. Now, the example I give my students is that of changing money. Now, at the time you're watching this, I have no idea how many euros there are to a dollar. Um, right now, I think there's something like a dollar twenty per euro. I think doesn't really matter. Let's say it's a dollar twenty. So let's say I have one euro in this hand and a dollar twenty in this hand, and let's say I can transform them back and forth. I can convert money without cost. I've got you know the, my buddy works at the bank or something, and it will make the exchange for me without uh, ex exacting a fee. So I haven't lost anything. If I've got a dollar in this hand and a dollar twenty in this hand and a euro in this hand, say, I have the same amount of money in both hands. They have the same buying power. I can buy the same stuff with both of them, but they look different. If I'm in Germany, I'm going to need euros. They're most most uh, German stores don't want dollars; they want euros. Well, if I'm in the U.S., I need dollars. So when I need to I, I need to go back and forth, say between those two places. I'm going to need to transform my money back and forth from one to the other. It's just that I need it in one form or another in order to work with it. And that's not a, that's not a bad analogy for what's going on here. So with that in mind, let's go to my computer and let's look at some examples of what integral transforms can do.